Um, this is, we talked just a little bit more information about something I talked about a lot yesterday, which is the role of the microbiome in COVID and long COVID. Prospective study of 106 patients with a broad range of symptom severity and 68 non-COVID controls. At six months, 76% of them had PASC, those common symptoms we saw before fatigue, poor memory, hair loss. Patients without it showed recovered gut microbiomes at six months. Patients with PASC had higher levels of negative bacteria. And so the persistent respiratory symptoms seem to be correlated with the opportunistic gut pathogens. So some people had guts that restored themselves, and some people had guts that may have been already on the way to being compromised because of pre-existing health status, and they needed some help to be restored. Um, the butyrate-producing bacteria, which is an anti-inflammatory substance, was the largest inverse correlation with PASC. And so um, anyway, what this tells you again is, is that pre-existing health status matters. And um, also another thing that you can try, and none of the stuff is expensive that we're talking about. Salt, visiting the salt room for an hour, not expensive. Probiotics, not expensive. Um, and, and changing your diet probably will cost you less money rather than more. That'll pay for the salt room and the, and the probiotics. So just paying attention to the basics of health really seems to be what the long COVID thing is about. Another study with 320 cases and 280 controls, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is associated with increased incidence of functional gastrointestinal disorders and disorders of the gut-brain interaction at one, three, six months after infection. Um, psychological counseling and probiotics would be the solution for that. 126 subjects with long COVID for an average of 108 days were given a probiotic containing lactobacillus and an inulin or prebiotic uh, for 30 days. Cough, fatigue, subjective well-being improved significantly. Gut symptoms improved in 25 out of 31 patients. Um, the, the, usually there's more than one thing going on and um, depression, anxiety, worry, perceived stress, loneliness before SARS-CoV-2 was associated with a 50% increased risk of developing long COVID and a 15 to 51% greater risk of impairment in daily life. And that psychological stress had a bigger impact on physical risk factors like smoking or comorbidity. So that's why we wanna to talk to people why you have to take a whole person approach because in many cases, this is what I've observed in my own uh, clients, you take a person who's not really healthy to start with, starts working at home with an enormous amount of stress, isolated, daily life interrupted, person gets COVID, so they were not in great health before. They're in worse health and a worse psychological state now. Now they get COVID, they have trouble recovering, which makes their psychological state worse. It's like a downward cycle from hell, you know, feedback loop from hell. And so to break out of that, you have to deal with the psychological issues and the gut issues and the health issues. And, and so again, you can see as this goes on, as I'm sharing this with you, the craziness of saying buy our supplement packs and it fixes all of this, it's not gonna. An analysis of two year retrospective cohort studies of patients diagnosed with COVID with um, compared with match control, mood and anxiety disorders were transient. There was no greater incidence of these diagnoses compared to those with other respiratory infections. In other words, Part of the panic, I think, is that, it's, that people think it's special to COVID and it's not. Increased risk of psychotic disorder, cognitive deficit, dementia, epilepsy, and seizure, a much higher risk at two years after infection with SARS-CoV-2. But again, you can tie that back to pre-COVID health status. The risk of death was significantly higher for older adults diagnosed with neurological psychiatric sequela after diagnosis of COVID-19 and other respiratory disorders. And I think that's why a lot of our, our elderly died isolated in, in living in a room with no human contact. Um, it's hard to imagine that uh, if those people had COVID, many of them would have died of COVID anyway by virtue of their age and comorbidities, but those who could have been saved were probably killed by the isolation and psychological stress. The risk is lower for children, except for those who have, again, comorbidities like epilepsy or seizures. Even mild infection can affect the brain, um, particularly if you're not taking very good care of your brain before you get an infection, which most people aren't. And by the way, uh, we don't have time to go into this right now, but what's good for the cardiovascular system is good for the brain. So cardiovascular disease is the leading killer of people in the United States. So you can just imagine what we're doing to our brains, right? 
Um, the UK biobanks, biospecimens from 785 patients, half with COVID, infected with COVID, half not. 95% of them were not hospitalized, they were mild cases, but MRI before and after infection showed structural changes in the brain. There was a significant reduction in brain volume, which is a risk factor for dementia. Areas of the brain with reduced volume had to do with um, decision-making and cognition, emotion, memory, and that's where your brain fog comes from. But this is what's really exciting. You can rebuild your brain a lot of ways, food is one of them, but with exercise, People who exercise have physically different brains. That's why I'm so smart. Actually, I'm just kidding, but you get my idea, right? The hippocampus, which is the key for memories, is stimulated by exercise that increases heart rate. So when I go run down to the river, I'm gonna be doing something good for my heart and good for my brain. Out of shape people grew new blood vessels in the hippocampus after just 12 weeks of exercise. Aerobic exercise, good for the heart, good for the brain. Any activity that increases blood flow promotes better brain health. Just think about it. Your cardiovascular system is the delivery method for oxygen and brain uh, to the brain and, and water and, and nutrients, right? Um, exercise has been shown to reverse age-related shrinkage of the brain. So if it can reduce age-related shrinkage, it can reduce COVID-related shrinkage. It positively impacts several comorbidities with long COVID, like cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and high levels of aerobic fitness, fitness are associated with increased hippocampal volume. And so one thing that I really think is important is interventions where there's a breadth of effect, right? Instead of uh, you've got an intervention for your blood vessels and an intervention for the brain and an intervention for this and that. Well, when you talk about changing your diet, taking a probiotic, exercising, you're talking about um, essentially the breadth of the effect. It affects everything. Your habits affect everything. And that's, a, that's so much better than this reductionist idea. You take a supplement for this and a drug for that. And it, you, know, you live your life differently and you impact you the entirety of your health. Aerobic activity increases something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. And that increases neuroplasticity and um, increases endothelial growth factor. Structured exercise lowers inflammation within only four weeks. Clotho is a hormone associated with longevity and protects against cognitive decline. And your clotho levels start to increase after only 20 minutes of intensive aerobic exercise. So, um, you know, there, there's exercise and there's exercise. I, I'm sitting in the front of my house in my front office and, and in my neighborhood, I see people strolling along. They stop and talk to the neighbors and they're walking their dog. And I think it's great. You're outside and you're walking around and you're with your dog, but that's not what we're talking about here, right? We're talking about doing something much more aggressive. 59 older sedentary adults engaging in aerobic exercise three times a week at six months, the gray matter was larger in the frontal lobe areas, memory and attention. The white matter was larger in the area that facilitates communication between the left and the right side of the brain. So a lot of this just common sense um, uh, interventions that you would recommend to anybody who wanted to improve their health. We get a lot of people who've never had really any diagnosis, but are just saying, look, I know I'm going the wrong direction. I'm overweight. I don't feel so great. And, you know, I want to turn this around before something happens. This is the stuff that you would tell these people to do. And it works if you're a little bit further down the path of poor health as well. The anterior hippocampus will shrink one to 2% a year, COVID or no COVID. 120 adults started a walking program three times a week and MRI showed exercise reversed shrinking and increased the anterior hippocampus and their memory improved. So um, th this is, you know, this is really simple, low tech, low cost stuff, right? It costs me nothing except having good shoes to go outside and run around a little bit in the sunshine today, right? You can do it too. Um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is another uh, option that's not particularly expensive. Insurance doesn't cover this. Insurance is not going to buy your running shoes and it's not going to cover HBO and it's not going to cover your probiotics. But I think we have to get away from the idea that if it's not covered by insurance, we're not willing to invest in it because actually what your insurance should be used for is, you know, you got hit by the bus kind of thing. So anyway, randomized sham controlled double blind trial. 73 patients with long COVID were randomized to treatment with hyperbaric, uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy 
um, for two months or sham treatment. And the results, HBO resulted in improvements in brain fog, pain, energy, sleep, anxiety, and depression. Loss of smell, very common, many people complaining about it. Study of 24 people in three groups, people with prolonged loss of smell after COVID-19, normal sense of smell after SARS-CoV-2, never had COVID, had normal sense of smell. And um, the researchers analyzed biopsies of the mucosa, all right? And, and they were looking for um, the, olfact the, you know, the olfactory neurons are responsible for smell. And so findings regarding loss of smell, ongoing inflammatory signaling, reduction in the number of olfactory sensory neurons, T cells producing interferon gamma dendritic enrichment, depletion of macrophages. In other words, what you're finding there, it's like an autoimmune process in the nose, right? And so now you can kind of understand if it's all localized to the nose, the salt therapy may actually help that. Um, researchers randomized 120 people with loss of smell due to COVID to treatment with Flonase or a placebo, inexpensive over-the-counter product. Both smell and taste improved within one week in all patients using Flonase. 2009 randomized studies showed that resensitization training improved sense of smell. This is all pre-COVID where patients sniffed intense odors two times a day for 12 weeks, and, and they really did get the ability to, um, uh, to improve their smell uh, due to this exposure. Um, there's little evidence to support supplements. There's a lot of hypothetical hypothesizing, like, well, based on this pathway, if you took this supplement, it should restore your smell. But my bet would be on either um, an antihistamine, or uh, salt therapy would be, or, or exposure therapy would, would be the ways to do this. Uh, fatigue related to inflammation, a study including 37 long haul COVID patients with and 36 without uh, severe fatigue. They looked at inflation, inflammation related monocyte gene expression, plasma levels of inflammatory cytokines, leukocyte and lymphocyte levels three to six months after hospital discharge and followed symptoms for a year. The fatigued patients showed increased expression of inflammatory genes. That's the bottom line. So this is a disorder of immune function. So everything that I said yesterday about, you know, immune function and, and um, uh, nutrition and immune function um, it, it pertains to here. And again, my guess would be that, uh, although this study didn't include it, that these people who have these symptoms, you know, the long, long COVID uh, symptoms, probably weren't in the best of health before. So if you were eating an inflammatory diet, carrying extra weight, you were sedentary and dehydrated before you got COVID, what happened is COVID just exacerbated the effect of all those bad habits and that bad state of health that you were in before. So fix that and this gets better. Um, the benefits of water fasting, lots of them, right? One of them is it's like uh, if the way I describe it to people, and I've sent probably well over 500 people to water fasting centers here under medical supervision in a resting state, um, is it's like rebooting your computer. And I'm sure you've all had this experience. You get to the place where um, your, your computer just isn't functioning and slow and all that sort of thing. So you get rid of the, all the cookies and you restart the computer and then things work fine for a good long time. That's the benefit of water fasting. It does need to be done under medical supervision. You have to be in a resting state. The duration of the fast, fast should be determined by experienced people who know how to uh, uh, supervise fasting patients and controlled refeeding is important for safety purposes as well. Um, there are several fasting centers around the country. Um, I have, I, I don't think there's a day of any year uh, with the possible exception of 2020 and 2021 uh, in the entirety of my career that I haven't had at least one person fasting at some facility in the United States because that's, uh, and, and by the way, again, I emphasize needs to be inpatient, in, in, an inpatient thing. Part of the reason is safety, and another part of the reason is in a resting state. And most people will tell you, if they're honest, that they can't be in a resting state, even if they stay home. I mean, you know, I, I, I am incapable of just laying on the couch in this house for very long. <laughs> There's always something I'm seeing that needs to be done, and the cat's flying around the room and all that. So lower information, inflammation protect your microbiome. 
Taking probiotics restores beneficial gut bacteria, reduces inflammation, can help prevent and treat infections. And along that line, avoid conventionally raised animal foods and farmed fish because they all contain antibiotics. And so you only want to take antibiotics when they're absolutely necessary. And there are times that they are. I mean, I had to take one in 1994 because I was bitten by a cat. And uh, my body started to swell up and shut down within a very short period of time. I wouldn't be talking to you right now if I hadn't taken the antibiotic at that time. However, most people are taking antibiotics when they're not necessary. They're terribly overprescribed, and people are consuming antibiotics in conventionally raised animal foods and farmed fish without even knowing it. How you lower inflammation, which is the hallmark of all disease. Hydration, weight loss, exercise, some supplements like ginger and turmeric can have some usefulness, but only as adjuvants. In other words, a, a rheumatoid arthritis patient um, who's doing all the right things might benefit from adding turmeric uh, to, uh, as to the regimen of health promoting activities. But the idea that um, and people take turmeric and, and ignore all the rest of that stuff. It's not magic stuff, right? None of these things are magic. Working at health is not a magical process. It's work. You have to work at being healthy because the, if you don't work at being healthy, you're going to have to work really hard at recovering from being sick. <laughs>